So, so on behalf of the center, I just wanted to uh, to welcome uh, Venerable Pema for uh, joining us uh, this evening and participating, uh, offering this class to our students. She's a new uh, member of our uh, international online faculty, but we're really grateful uh, that she was able to accept our invitation. Uh, she's a graduate of the basic program and the master's program. So we're all in very, very capable hands uh, as we go through the course. So I just wanted to uh, extend my own uh, sense of gratitude that uh, that you're here and that you're helping our students in this way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernabul. Okay, so with the module we're doing is on refuge and, uh, you know, we're going to experience a, a progression in our understanding is the anticipation, right? So um, it's going to be unfolding. I'd like to just start initially with uh, some refuge prayers and then uh, we can go into some more details. So I'm just going to screen share uh, with you now. Does that come up for you guys? Okay, so let's see. So we'll do just the refuge and body cheetah together to start with. And um, we can do it in English and perhaps as we feel more comfortable, we can do it in Tibetan. Sometimes I find chanting the Tibetan sort of um, enables me more to reflect on the meaning of, of the refuge prayer. Uh, but that is also a progression. <clears throat> now, you might have noticed I've changed the, the last line, uh, the, the third line here to by the merits of listening to the Dharma, as opposed to by the merits of generosity and so forth, you know, accumulating the collections. Um, so that's one of the, the changes there, depending on the circumstance as to whether it's in our general practice or whether it's in a teaching. So those who are familiar, can have a mental prostration, a verbal prostration in in saying the the verse, and uh, a physical prostration with our um, in the mood of prostration at our heart. So I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. And so... What I'd like for, for you to do is just personally, like it's not um, about sharing responses at the moment, but just take a, a brief moment just to reflect on what was going through your mind as you recited the Refuge Bodhicitta prayer and what feelings did it bring up for you? Was it something where you could reflect on the meaning as you recited it? Maybe bring to mind qualities? Or did it just move too fast? How do we, um, how do we speak? How do I interrupt you? Uh, so at the moment, we're not interrupting. So who am I speaking to just so I can direct Betsy? Betsy. Betsy. Hi, Betsy. You're so just we're telling just... us to think. Yeah, yeah, just a, a reflection, not to share at this stage. It's just a personal reflection. But certainly I'll be asking you to speak very soon. And as you did, just simply unmute. Um, keep it muted when you're not talking so that we can't hear the dogs barking and everything else, the phone's ringing. Um, but as you did, Betsy, you can just interrupt as you as you choose. Thank you very much for showing us. Yeah, so taking that moment just to personally reflect and not share at this stage what came up for you because this is our starting point. And I'd like to think as we progress throughout the course and the six weeks together, that maybe we'd see some sort of progression or change happening in our mind, the greater the understanding that we have about the subject refuge, 
in Buddha Dharma Sangha, then obviously the greater meaning we can apply to the prayer. Okay, so the other thing it, which I would like for you to do is to just because this is our first uh, week together, our first time together. And so in some ways, the, you know, this session is going to be a little bit more loose because, you know, we need to, I don't want to just be lecturing you. Do you know what I mean? That I, I don't see the benefit in that. I mean, there is benefit, of course, but um, more benefit comes through me knowing where you're at. So then I can help you best. Um, certainly not harm, but hopefully only benefit. That's uh, my daily prayer. So, yeah, I'd like to know from individuals, um, you know, what are your thoughts on refuge? And where or how you see that it fits in with practice. So just just like a one or two sentences, if you know, from some people that might like to contribute. So what are your thoughts around refuge and where and how does it fit? I think refuge sort of means a place to hide in a storm. And you guys have some storms right now in America, yeah? yeah. 20 million people exposed to storm. So, um, you know. Well, I, was, I was actually maybe talking about personally. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Anyone else thoughts on refuge and where and how it fits in with the, the Buddha Dharma, the practice? I. This is Thomas. Um, where are you, Thomas? I can't see you. I've got oh, the... Maybe. The okay. mountains behind me. No problem. I, I got you. It, with all of the challenges, frustrations, and so on in, in daily life, um, I've studied some dharma before, and I know the benefit that comes to me in, in practicing dharma. But I forget. And there are many times when, when I'm frustrated or anxious, and if I would meditate, if I would use some of the things that I've learned about Dharma, I, I would be much more at ease. And so I'm kind of trying to, to emphasize going to the Dharma for, for that kind of reassurance and, and steadiness in my life. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for all of that. So, yes, Kodo, do I say your name correctly? Yeah. Or is Hi. It Latif how do I say, how do I address you? Is it Latif? Kodo. Kodo. No, okay. Kodo. Thank you, Kodo. Um, for me, the, the ritualized prayers and putting my hands together and taking a moment of breath, and then it's an anchor. And what I get is like an energetic connecting. And uh, it's very, makes me feel happy and peaceful and ready, like active. Wow. I'm, okay, here we go. And it's like, boom, and all right, let's do this. So it kind of makes my head tingle and yeah. I get op a little fluffy open and I'm, I'm ready to take in. Okay, as best Paola, I can. Can we make Kodo as, as a co-host? She may need to screen share and take over. <laughs> she might have a better understanding than I do. <laughs> That's beautiful, Kodo. Thanks for all of that. That's gorgeous. Very wonderful. Did anyone else feel a sense of wanting to share? I put mine in the chat. I put everything in the chat. Thank you. I, I try to pay attention when I can to the chat. Thank you for that. Okay, so we didn't actually get to where it fits in. And, you know, sometimes we could think that it fits into the small scope. You know, the lamb room into the three scopes. So do we, do we think that like it fits, you know, neatly into the small scope and it's like a beginner practice? Do we think like a bookend, like you've got your refuge body cheetah prayer, you got your dedication, and it's kind of like your bookends, but really the substance is in the middle, whatever practice we're getting to? All the, all the scopes? 
Mm -hmm. It's the foundation of all of them. Um, what I would request, if I may, uh, just because I want to notice you, is when you when you speak, would it might would you mind just saying your name so I can uh, until we learn each other's uh, names and faces because it's just with the screen. It's like who sure. said that? Sure, yeah. it's Danny. Thanks, Danny. Great. Yeah, it does fit into all the the practices. You're right, and uh, it's certainly not just like a a beginner practice. In fact, um, you know, as you said, you know, it's the foundation, uh, although it does begin all of our, our Dharma practices, whether it be small, medium, great scope, whether it be Hinayana, Mahayana, Mahayana Sutra, Mahayana Tantra, does not matter. Like it fits in with all of those and is a necessary foundation for everything. It's the foundation for us to take lay vows or monastic vows bodhisattva vows, tantric vows, you know. Um, it's even uh, one of the four opponent powers. So when we engage in purification practices, the power of the support or the power of reliance incorporates, you know, refuge and then bodhicitta. So it's a way in which we can purify negativities and accumulate, you know, much merit. So... Uh, even as, you know, tantric practitioners, when we get to that stage and in discovering Buddhism, that's one of your last modules. Uh, when people get to highest yoga tantra, for instance, where they take vows, they get commitments, samayas, then, you know, it's even a samaya to go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. So it's certainly uh, not isolated to the small scope, although that's where we, we learn about it. And whether the small scope practitioner is aiming for happiness of future lives and being protected from the lower realms, so refuge is a part of that, or whether to, to be pure refuge as a like at least a middle scope practitioner and be seeking liberation, then refuge, pure refuge, would be coming in there. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, great scope and, you know, Tantra vehicle, uh, also refuge there for, for quickly attaining enlightenment. And so we'll go into unpack a little bit more the, the prayer uh, shortly. But also, what, and do I speak too fast for you guys with my accent? It's okay. So you can tell me to slow down if you like. Okay. Um, also, the other thing which I've noticed, and it's, it's thanks to your kindness, is in preparing this module, um, you know, I've been a nun for, it's coming up to the 14th year next year. So February begins, a, you know, the 14th year. And, and I, I have studied the various programs and stuff with as much, you know, effort as I can uh, endeavor to do. But still, what I notice in preparing this course is the evolution of refuge. You know, due to the kindness of you guys, I feel in some ways, some of that evolution, that deepening one's understanding in refuge, the more we understand, the more we can bring to the meaning of refuge. And I think it's this uh, constantly unfolding, you know, it doesn't just stay as a beginner practice. And so I think that's the beauty. And uh, certainly, the more we understand how things exist, uh, conventional truth, ultimate truth, the more we understand the two truths, how things exist. And then from that learning about the four truths, which Venerable Domdrop asked me to do a course on that, uh, starting, I think, in February. So I'm hoping you guys can join us for that as well, because it's a nice follow on. So the more we understand the two truths and from there the four truths, how we enter into cyclic existence by way of true origins, bringing about true suffering, our samsara, and then how to exit, to reverse, to exit cyclic existence through true, true paths, bringing about true origins. So the more we understand the two truths and, and understand the four truths, then all of that deepens our refuge in the three jewels. 
So it's this constantly evolving process. And so I wanted initially for us to just take that moment of reflection where we didn't share how in, uh, how our mind was at the time when we recited the refuge prayer and what feeling it generated. But that's our base point in just a general way. Other times it's stronger you know, other times it's, you know, weaker, but for where our baseline was now, and then we're going to, you know, keep in mind as we progress and uh, generate those moments of reflection. And certainly at the beginning of each uh, class in the future going forward, when it's not so much housekeeping and coming together initially like this, I'd like to start with a, a meditation just a brief meditation to really establish the causes of refuge before we then go into the refuge prayer. And so I think this is the place um, to, to begin in that way as well going forward. So the other thing with refuge, you know, when we, when we think about the meaning of the word and certainly the different ways it's elaborated uh, when it's translated from Tibetan to English by the very skilled, skilled translators, like um, Jeffrey Hopkins and, you know, all these amazing people. So they talk about refuge. They talk about protection. They talk about savior or protector or deliverer, uh, you know, like a safe direction. And so all these words uh, can help us, I think, to understand the import of refuge. And I think one thing that uh, we try as much as possible to avoid is just mouth dharma. You know, we just recite the words in Tibetan or English of refuge, bodhicitta, and we're too busy thinking about, you know, what's next or still reminiscing about something that's happened. So our mouth is engaged in the, the recitation, English or, or Tibetan, but our mind is completely elsewhere. And so, you know, this uh, refuge body tutor, for instance, starts all of our practices. And so it's not something just to be hurried over to get to the, the main part of the, the teaching or the practice. But uh, through developing our, our heart in, in response to refuge, Buddha Dharma Sangha, in developing this, then we can really uh, try to have an undistracted mind and focus on the meaning. And as a, as a byproduct, the more we can actually take refuge, even when we're not reciting a prayer to prompt us, but take refuge, then the more we can feel this confidence and this sense of protection and purpose and meaning and direction and, you know, connection and support, you know, we can feel the benefit and we can even become quite fearless in, in our understanding and our, our way of being in the world. So it's very rich. Um, so tonight and over the next six weeks, tonight I thought it, to, to give a bit of a general overview We'll uh, soon launch into uh, so looking at the causes of refuge, unpack the bodhicitta refuge prayer, uh, looking at the various elements in there. And uh, we may get to the different types like ultimate and conventional and even symbolic refuge uh, as far as Buddha Dharma Sangha goes. And then over the next, uh, say, three weeks, I thought to spend some time just on Buddha jewel, then Dharma jewel, then Sangha jewel, not to be hurried or rushed, but actually take some time to connect in isolation to them and how we can strengthen our connection to each of them over the next three weeks. And then uh, I have to uh, sort of, I, I think it's nice to anyway, uh, look at different ways of meditating on the refuge prayer so that when you uh, have your retreat weekend, you know how to engage with it, and even just in your own practice, so different different ways of meditating. And then also, uh, if, you know, if we have time in the last two weeks, we can look at the commitments of taking refuge, the various trainings, what to adopt, what to, uh, you know, refrain from, 
uh, taking of lay vows. And if we get there, we can have a brief look at the refuge preliminary practice. So that's my plan for the next six weeks. Um, if you wish to go in a different direction and it's, you know, something that you, you all feel, then you can take me in that direction as well. So I'm not hard and fast that this is the plan that we must follow. Okay, that's, wh that's where we're headed. So we've just been through, oh gosh, you know, COVID pandemic. And uh, I think it's worth just taking uh, like a moment to have uh, a little bit of personal reflection at, and it may not just be COVID, it might be, you know, you're going through your own tumultuous seas of samsara, emotional suffering, physical suffering, you know, your mental suffering and so forth. But when you go through these rough times, Think about who or what it is that you're seeking refuge in to alleviate those negative feelings. So I would like you to uh, keep your microphones off for now. And just for the next maybe five minutes, we'd, um, I prompt you in some questions and I'd like you to think about some responses, if that's okay, please. So when going through rough times, whatever they look like for you individually. Bring them up in your mind and who and who or what is it that you seek refuge in? What things? I mean, if I was living where most of you guys are net right now, I'd be seeking refuge in the sun and warmth and the heater, okay? Because I'm quite a baby in the cold. So when times are a bit tough, Perhaps you feel down or depressed at times or overwhelmed. At such occasions, what's giving you that sense of comfort or support? might be worldly objects maybe like the for me it was like the soft touch of my dog you know the cuddling up to my dog the soft soft fur it could be um, a partner friends drugs alcohol what's your refuge Some people think anger can protect them. They can take refuge in anger to keep people away. When things are tough, do you give um, seek refuge in objects of attachment? Online shopping, music. Or do you take refuge in ignorance? Just sleep it off, go to bed, have a big sleep, forget about it. And so whatever it is that you rely upon, 
or seek uh, a level of support or comfort from when things are tough. I imagine that these are mostly temporary refuges, giving you some sort of temporary comfort. But do they actually free us entirely so that these problems, anxieties, illnesses, and so forth, afflictions, negative karmas, and so forth, don't ever ripen again? So it's not saying that for a temporary problem, we don't seek temporary support. Okay? The middle way. But all of these ultimate problems that we have, driven by karma and afflictions, will never be pacified with a temporary solution. Okay. So I think it's just important to get to know what it is that you personally take refuge in. And as you go about the next week, Bring that to mind. What am I seeking refuge in right now? When I'm feeling this way, what's my response? Am I grabbing for food? Am I grabbing for drink? Am I grabbing for a, a, a nice cuddle or something like this? What am I seeking refuge in? And it's not saying, if it's not harmful, that is, it's not saying don't engage in that, but just know that it's a counterfeit refuge. It's a momentary relief but it's not going to solve the big problem of why we're experiencing that because of our karma and afflictions driving the, you know, the show for us. And so just recognizing what's a counterfeit refuge, what's a worldly refuge and, and recognizing that if there is some temporary relief, it's not necessarily going to be worth it particularly if it's indulging attachment aversion and ignorance and so forth which is just going to perpetuate our suffering in samsara i think it was thomas at the beginning you mentioned about you know like in daily life wanting to actually rely more on the triple gem you know and i think this is this is the key for all of us thomas myself included right as as we evolve in our understanding of refuge that we do go beyond those temporary reliefs and look to actually get over this entirely so if we're seeking inner happiness the cause can only be internal there has to be this compatibility internal happiness being a result necessarily the substantial cause must be internal so it's just bringing awareness and uh, trying not to just be on autopilot all the time i'm reminded of um in liberation of the palm of your hand Pabon Rinpoche, I, I loved this when i when i first read it he said um, do not put your hopes in the worldly petition the divine do not put your hopes in the worldly, whether it be people or things, you know, but petition the divine, petition the, the, the guru, the, the triple gem, the infallible guides who have overcome their suffering, who have overcome their cyclic existence and therefore can show us the way, the path, so that we too can, can do that. And the other thing I, I think about is uh, Lama Zupa Rinpoche uh, very emphatically one time said, when you say Lama Kien, Lama Kien, Lama Kien, you know, Guru, think of me, Guru, think of me, Guru, think of me. 
he said so emphatically, he said, he listens, he pays attention, he's there. So in some ways, it's kind of like, oh, you know, taking that trust at, at this stage, uh, perhaps with some faith until I develop the conviction, okay, through reasons and logic and so forth, but taking at least on the basis of faith, based on what the guru has said very, you know, pointedly, that the guru listens. He always responds. And so when we've got these temporary challenges that are going on, um, we do need temporary cures. Like if we have sickness, we go to the doctor, right? You know, we get the medicine. We don't just think, oh, you know, triple gem will solve it. Not like that. That's crazy thinking. So we do say take temporary refuge in things, but we, we bring to mind that it is just a temporary cure. And the real refuge that we can rely upon wholeheartedly is the Dharma refuge. So Buddha being omniscient, Buddha's mind pervades all phenomena. So pervades every every object of knowledge, pervades our body, every part of our body, every part of our mind, every moment is known by Buddha. And so where the Buddha's mind pervades all, necessarily his body pervades all. Body and mind being inseparable like that for the, the wind and mind, you know, for a Buddha. And wherever Buddha's holy body is, is Buddha's holy speech. And so these are never separated. And if we have like bad dreams or sometimes even when we're, you know, we're actually awake, but it feels like something, you know, really bad is happening, then we can at those times in particular go for refuge and it does become our protection. Okay. So where Buddha's mind is, the body is, where the body is, the speech is. And so we can access Lama Kien. We can access Guru. Think of me. We can access the Guru Triple Gem for whatever comes up. We can invoke Tara for help and so forth. All right. I'd like to screen share and just have a look at, um, let's see, I'll just get it up on the screen. Yeah, where are we up to? Um, actually, I'll just pause. And, um, okay, I'm just going to hop out up there for a second. Feel free to sing amongst yourselves while we're getting ready. All right. So let's see. Technology, huh? Technology is very, very wonderful, really, because it's, you know, in like COVID, for instance, those times, the pandemic, how incredibly fortunate we were as practitioners to have countless Buddhist teachings, you know, amazing. So many so that we could barely keep up, right? All right. So I'll just um, organize my screen so I can see you guys. Here we go. All right. So uh, do you see the screen that I'm intending to show there? Okay, great. All right. So I thought we might just make a start. Um, so, you know, refuge is really one of the entrances. So we talk about different entrances, different doors, and uh, like refuge is the entrance to all our Buddhist practice, whether it be Hinayana, Mahayana, Mahayana Sutra, Mahayana Tantra. And just like uh, Bodhicitta, for instance, is another door, the door of the Mahayana. So refuge is the, the refuge is into the three jewels. The Buddha Dharma Sangha is the entrance by which we enter the teachings, by which we enter into all of our practice. So, all right. So Buddha Dharma Sangha, when we talk about these 
you know, there's different terminology and so forth. And I will elaborate as we progress, but Buddha is really the teacher of refuge. You know, it is a final object of refuge in the sense that there is no greater, no, no more to, no more to do, no more to abandon, no more fear. Fear will make sense when I and talk about the causes. So, in this sense, you know, Buddha is the final refuge that we're that we're seeking, and the the Buddha can't, you know, uh, wash away our negativities and remove, you know, our suffering and all of these sorts of things for us, but can teach the the way, teach the path, teach the actual refuge, the Dharma. And so it's really the Dharma, the Dharma jewel is the actual refuge. It's what actually gives us the protection. So when we can cultivate the Dharma internally, from that we will be protected, protected from suffering, protected from karma, protected from afflictions and, and so forth, any sort of problems. And the Sangha is the, the third of the, the three jewels that we're talking about. And they really who help us. So if you think about who's helping us accomplish the Dharma internally, it's really the Sangha, um, you know, Lama Zorba Rinpoche, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and so forth. You've had Geshe Jumpa Gelek, one of my teachers uh, at your center. I hope you, you were able to catch him. And so the Arya beings, those who have realized emptiness, those who are progressing through the stages of the paths, all the way revealing the way to practice and how to attain the state of Buddhahood. So Buddha Dharma Sangha is really, as Chandra Kirti has said in his 70 verses on taking refuge, it's, it's, uh, they are the refuge for those desirous of liberation. So it's not for just, you know, some insignificant thing like a temporary problem we have, but we can utilize the three jewels for that, right? Um, it's not just to be free of the lower realms. That's not pure refuge, although it is a refuge for the small scope practitioner. But the real purpose behind refuge is at least liberation, liberation and enlightenment. So the Buddha's got nothing left to fear. That's the, as Mahayanas, that's what we're aiming for. Nothing left to fear means he or we, when we attain Buddhahood, will have, in this case, Shakyamuni Buddha, will have abandoned not only afflictive obscurations, as an Ahad has already abandoned, but abandoned the knowledge obscurations. Now, I don't know if you use knowledge obscurations as terminology or cognitive obscurations. What are you more familiar with? We're talking, someone there? I want to make sure I use the language you, you guys use. So the, we're talking about the imprints of afflictions, and they're what throw up the appearances. So why things appear to exist independently, truly or inherently, and so forth. So the Buddha's abandoned all of these things, and so has nothing left to fear. And the, the the Dharma that we're talking about there, the, the real refuge, the actual refuge, is true paths and true cessations. So that's why we're talking about the Sangha jewel being Arya beings. So true paths is uh, from the path of seeing. The main one is, not the only, but the main one is this wisdom realizing emptiness. So it is the, the true path. It is what causes us to abandon or separate from sufferings. And it's the true cessation that is what is actually the separation from suffering. We've overcome suffering, you know, attained it. The ultimate true cessation would be nirvana. Okay, so these true paths and true cessations in the continuum of an Arya being are not a final object of refuge because they still have, when they go into this subsequent attainment out of their meditative equipoise, they still have these appearances of true existence. They still have things to abandon. And so really it's only the, the Buddha that's his final object of refuge. Okay. Same with the, the Sangha jewel, they're not a final object of refuge because they we're talking about Arya beings here, non-Buddhas, 
And so they still have objects to abandon. But if we were to talk about uh, the Dharma Jewel and the Sangha School, the, the Dharma Jewel and the Sangha Jewel and say pervasively, they are not a final refuge. They're not an ultimate refuge. Well, we couldn't say that because Dharma Jewel in the continuum of a Buddha is a final refuge. Sangha Jewel, the Buddha is a person as well. So it is a, a Sangha Jewel. So I, that's just for anyone who likes a little bit of um, pervasiveness and, and so forth. But, but if it just went over your head, don't worry, just let it go because we will revisit it. And also it's, it's not really that important. It's just um, for those who like to have things, you know, quite like me. <laughs> if there's anyone else out there who likes things neatly packaged and pervasive and without contradiction and so forth. Um, yeah, anyway. So the Buddha being the final refuge, the teacher of refuge, the Buddha has said, uh, you know, I showed the path to liberation to you, but know that liberation itself depends on you. So the Buddha can only reveal the path to liberation, but it's up to us to take the Dharma jewel into our own continuum and to actually uh, become liberated. That is the only way we're going to actually, the actual refuge, the actually part, become protected. All right. So basically all the, the Buddha's teachings, all 84,000, you know, have been taught for this very purpose of attaining liberation, being free of suffering and its causes. Okay. So then if we look at these causes, when we talk about causes, we're really talking about, if you do it from a Hinayana point of view, you talk about two causes. So fear and faith. Now, fear, can people can get triggered by that word. And I think it's important in Dharma that, you know, Dharma has a very specific language to it. And I think for the purity of the Dharma, um, it's, it's good to learn the language of Dharma. So I think sometimes if we try to water things down and use different terminology all the time, I think um, we can water down the teachings as well. So I generally like to stick to the, the language of Dharma, but I do like to elaborate the meaning in case you're not sure what it is. But also I think it's a good skill. Like when we deal with computers, you know, you talk the terminology of computers, right? So like that. So fear and faith. So the fear that we're talking about, Lama Zoprimashe has mentioned it before, is useful fear or intelligent fear. It's not the fear that we bring with our worldly minds to, you know, what that means. And I'll elaborate on that in a moment. But also, if we're talking about causes of refuge from a Mahayana point of view, then we're going to talk about three. So you can see I've got them there, fear, faith, and compassion. Okay, so, you know, um, this, what we do need to fear is everything that, you know, goes on for us in the sense of our anxiety, our delusions, you know, our, our behaviors that disconnect us from others, our self-cherishing ways, our self-grasping, you know, all the, the ways we find ourselves complaining and alone and, uh, you know, feeling helpless or abandoned by others or people don't recognize our value, diminish us and, and so forth. You know, all of these is what we do need to fear. We do need to overcome and abandon all of these destructive emotions and so forth. And so, you know, we, we can't go expecting um, the same, the different results from doing the same thing. So if we can get some sort of fear, healthy fear, useful fear, intelligent fear, that fears uh, being in the same situation again and again and again, you know, within this life and after this life, life after life, then that's what we need to do. So we, if we can get healthy fear of this self-grasping, this self-grasping ignorance that holds to an eye or mind to inherently exist by which we then divide everything, self and other, those that are close to me and I want to protect them, those that harm those that I'm close to or harm me, my people I find uh, challenging, I want to keep at bay. 
So, you know, we, on the basis of all of this, we generate this attachment and anger and jealousy and pride and all of these afflictions. Then we give rise to actions of body, speech, and mind, and we create through this, these actions, this karma, we create suffering. So these are the sorts of things that we want to fear. These are the things that will take us to the lower realms. So fearing the lower realms is just the entry point you know, like a small scope, the stages of the path in common with the small scope practitioner. We don't want to go to the lower realms. We have perhaps a precious human rebirth, right? I'll assume we have precious human rebirth. We've met the precious teachings of the Buddha, the complete teachings of Sutra and Tantra. This is, this is remarkable. We've met unmistaken teachings, unmistaken guides. We really have all the internal and external conditions right now. But like sand through the hourglass, you know, days of our lives, um, this life is running out. And we actually don't know if our breath will, you know, be the last out breath, even today. And so these are not just words, but this is reality. And so although we have precious human rebirth, we've met the perfect guides, death and impermanence are in our face constantly. You only got to look at social media or the news to see how it's in the face, you know, all the shootings and so forth, accidents, person drowning in his car today, um, you know, in, in the floods. So death and impermanence is amongst us. And at the time of death, we're only going to go either up or down, down to the lower realms, or as we wish for, to get a, a succession of precious human rebirths, or at least, if not that born in pure realms. And so refuge, this fear of the lower realms is one thing, but it's not enough because even if we take rebirth in the higher realms, well, that's where we are now and we still suffer. So it's not enough to aim for. It's not enough for, to, for utilizing for the, their, their true worth, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. So we do need to develop fear, useful fear, not only of the lower realms, but of suffering in samsara. And then we'll actually start to take the essence of of refuge in, in what it's intended for, this, this pure refuge. So that's the, the first cause of refuge is actually generating a sense of fear of these things, fear of samsara. If we don't have fear of samsara when we go for refuge, our causes are incomplete. Therefore, our refuge is incomplete. So this, this is something we all need to develop and remind ourselves and pay attention to. And that's why each session Going forward, I'm going to start with that meditation to cultivate these causes. So this next one is the uh, Mahayana added cause. So from fear and faith, we add in compassion. Now, compassion to actually not just be, you know, thinking the word compassion and just doing lip service to it. We really need to get in touch firstly with our own sense of suffering. So this fear of samsara. You know, if we if we wish to abandon our sansara, we need to develop renunciation. The wish to be free of suffering, right? And its causes. The wish to be free from samsara. If we develop this renunciation, this mind that wishes to definitely emerge from samsara. Well, another way of looking at renunciation is self-compassion. So if we can develop self-compassion, then we have the basis from which we can launch, wishing we'll focus on ourselves, wishing ourselves to be free of suffering. We then change the object to others, wishing others to be free of suffering. So we've got a launch pad to go from renunciation to great compassion. <clears throat> and that's one of the, the causes of refuge there for the Mahayanist. And, you know, others are, are countless and uh, numberless sentient beings experience suffering endlessly in samsara and they are the cause of all my past, present, future happiness. 
whatever we experience now is all due to the kindness of others, whether it be the, the heat in our room right now, the hot chocolate you might be sipping to keep warm, um, you know, the, the, the Zoom, everything, the clothing, shelter, whatever, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha even have come from sentient beings. So in that sense, you know, remembering this kindness, we do have this sense of responsibility that just as uh, we are dependent on them for all of our past, present, future happiness, even our enlightenment, then also it's like they need to be able to depend on us, that we are responsible for all sentient beings. And so this great compassion or compassion that takes responsibility, I myself alone will make it happen, you know, the taking this responsibility that we will actually free others from samsara as well. And then we need to rely on the, the uh, guru, triple gem, the three jewels, the three rare sublime ones. We need to rely on them with some sort of sense of faith. But this isn't just some sort of, you know, blind faith. We actually want to develop our faith through reasons and logic and actually get to get to the point of a valid cognition where we can see that, yes, we can overcome all our suffering and causes of suffering. And this is the beauty, if you can join me for the, the Four Noble Truths course in, in February, because we will go through the exact reasoning of how this is so and be able to apply it and develop some sort of uh, conviction or um, move in the direction of developing conviction that this is possible. It's not just words. So th this is the power of, uh, of, of these, yeah, of doing as many teachings as we can. So the stronger our fear being a cause for refuge, the stronger the result. The stronger the cause, the stronger the result. So um, that's just something to bear in mind, okay, whether it be taking vows or, or taking causes of refuge or whatever, we, you know, the intensity with which we motivate something, the stronger the actual vow will be or the refuge will be and so forth. So the other thing with, um, with this fear, quite often uh, we talk about fear being, you know, fear of what? Well, fear of samsara, what's samsara? You know, it's basically the, the, the circle of suffering that's come about due to the causes of karma and afflictions, true origins. So we talk about this sort of fear, which is really fear of afflictive obscurations, you know. But the compassion aspect, the Mahayana extra cause there of compassion, you can also think of uh, the 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 extra cause being fear of knowledge obscurations. That can be um, another another thing because, you know, what stops us from attaining Buddhahood and benefiting sentient beings limitlessly in exactly accord with their disposition is the knowledge obscurations. It's that which mainly hinders our omniscience, our enlightenment. So and that's another fear you could say, you know, fear of... Um, is samsara, which you could say fear of afflictive obscurations, then the compassion part, fear of knowledge obscurations, or you could just say fear of being unable to protect sentient beings. So there's various ways to elaborate that Mahayana fear that we're talking about there, the specific to, to Mahayana. So when we talk about the, the faith in the three jewels, we really want to get to the point where we can actually know through experience validly that they are able to protect us. And remember, the Dharma jewel was the ultimate um, in the sense of what we're aiming for, in the sense of it being the actual protection. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, sorry, one last thing there. Uh, there, there we go. I'm an amateur at this. Sorry, apologies. So, entrusting ourselves to the three jewels. So as I was saying, um, I believe it's, you know, with refuge that there's this evolution of refuge, you know, that we evolve and deepen our refuge as, as time goes on. And we want to really get to the point where we fully entrust ourselves wholeheartedly to the three jewels. Okay, so you, you all know the analogies, right, of um, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha you know, being like doctor, medicine and nurse. And I think this is a really great analogy because here we are, we do have this long-term illness, okay? 
We are the patient and we've got a terminal illness. We're subject to, to death at any time. We don't know when, but karmically it can happen even today. So we have this chronic illness of uncontrolled birth, sickness, aging, death, you know, all the sufferings we have, all our, you know, <clears throat> anxieties and neuroses and all of this that we experience. And it's quite inescapable. Life after life, beginningless lives we've been doing this. Endlessly we will continue to suffer unless we do something different. And so we can barely even uh, care for ourselves. And yet we, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and yet we endeavor to care for others, right? So seeing ourselves as this chronically ill patient can be really helpful. And then as far as the Buddha goes, well, you know, the Buddha is not just any doctor, but like the most supremely skilled doctor that we can imagine. And the Buddha has diagnosed already um, you know, what our situation is and fully diagnosed and fully given a, a, a curative treatment plan and laid it all out step by step for us, exactly what we need to do in order as well of how we need to progress. And so, you know, we've also got a team of nurses, the Sangha, who already embody these qualities that we seek and are revealing how to progressively follow that treatment plan themselves. And so you've got the patient, the doctor, the, the, the medicine being the Dharma, and then the nurse. And so we've got all of these amazing things at our disposal in the entire Lam Rim. But the, the problem is we, we don't generate the causes for refuge. We don't generate the fear. And, you know, we kind of like don't take wholeheartedly this refuge and rely on it infallibly. We're too busy seeking our, our worldly, you know, grasping out here, there and everywhere for our temporary refuges. And so, you know, in that way, we it's no wonder we suffer, right? But having all these internal conditions and external conditions at our disposal right now, like this is like just so amazing. And so over these next six weeks, I'd really love for us to really deepen this practice and really try to um, immerse ourselves as much as possible in trying to understand the three jewels and, you know, trying to be a good patient. So if we've got a treatment plan, like say the lamb rim, for instance, sutra and tantra, then we've got to follow it and start in the, the correct order as well. So we can't just go, you know, skipping doses or taking the medicine once and thinking, oh, it didn't cure me. It doesn't work. You know, um, we can't just like take the medicine and put it on our bookshelf or, you know, store the medicine in our bathroom cabinet and never open the door and, and you know, utilize it. So like the Buddha said, you know, I show the path to liberation, but liberation itself depends on you. So the Buddha from his side has done everything to reveal the entire path for us. But now it comes up to comes down to us to act. And so it'd be really awesome if over the next um, six weeks, we could really try to commit. Uh, studying on Zoom is really hard uh, because there's just so many distractions and you know, like we behave often in ways that we wouldn't in class, like, you know, get a messages and, you know, to have a read and miss, oh, I've got an email. You know, it's very easy to get distracted. Or if you're like me, if you're like a sucker for animals and you've got dogs or cats, be like, oh, I'd be so excited, you know, you know, attached to my animals that I'd be so distracted. So being on Zoom really poses a lot of challenges. And, uh, and I don't get that impression from you guys that you guys are as distracted as as I would be because a lot of you are paying attention. You've got your cameras on, which is really good practice. But like I really like salute and praise you for being so committed and to, to do this via Zoom and to show this level of um, interest. And, yeah, it's just really, really totally cool. So I rejoice and I hope we're in for the, the long-term treatment regime together so that we can find this cure that we seek. Now, I was just wondering, maybe I've talked enough for the time being before I go on. Is, are there any uh, people who have questions or, or doubts or maybe I didn't express something clearly 
or maybe I said something that triggered you and it's best to express what might have triggered you so that we can unpack that and come to an understanding. Is there any anyone who would like to express something before I go on to anything new? Or do you need a break as well? Like we've been going at it an hour. Do you need a five minute break or are you okay? No one's talking that I can hear. I sent you a text. I sent you a text. Who's oh, that? Danny. Danny. Oh, I'm just replying to her now. Um, yes, my friends, where are we at? Oh, do we need a couple of minute break? Do you need to stretch? Do you need to get a cup of tea? Where are you at? Do you have questions? One minute break for water. <laughs> what good is one minute? Is that enough? I was going to say, what good is one Yeah, minute? to drink oh, that's like water. <laughs> Just water. I need water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Venerable Dondra, what's the usual format for a program like this with a two-hour teaching? Do you usually give a bit of a break for like uh, three, four, five minutes just to stretch your legs or two minutes or do we just keep going? Um, often people just kind of go straight through, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's it can be anything. I'm happy to go straight through if you guys are. I just didn't want you bored and falling asleep and going, oh, will she stop already? <laughs> oh, this is boring. It's the most exciting thing in life. Sorry, what was that, Diani? Am I saying your name right? This isn't boring. It's the most interesting thing in my life. Oh, <laughs> good. Me yeah. personally. Do I say Dani? Is that right? You can say whatever you like. Dani is more like the Sanskrit kind of way, and Dani is like Daniela, which is my name. Diani? Is that how you said to say it? No, Dani is what I usually go by, but people say Dani all the time, and that's fine too. Oh, okay. I'll just say Dani. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, Venerable uh, Pema, Dan here. I've just got a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm looking for you. There you are, Dan. Hey, Dan. Hey, hey. Um, you just mentioned, I think I might have answered the question. Uh, you might have answered the question as uh, you went on, but you mentioned that um, you referred to renunciation and how it's a sort of launch pad to compassion. Now, yeah. you're not talking about renouncing at the coffee or the chocolate cake. Or the Hell beer. No. You're, you're, talking, you're talking about like <laughs> you're talking beer, about re yes. renounce. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about like more like re renouncing samsara, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, Dan. Yeah, I'm talking. Dan's Dan's from um, DB. I taught about six years ago. Um, he, so he's for those who haven't met him. Um, so he lives not far from me at the Sunshine Coast. So yeah, totally, Dan. I'm talking about renunciation, like we did in the Twelve Links course. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Recently. Yep. Yeah, so where you want to totally be free of samsara, like just totally want to be free of true origins, the causes of samsara, mm -hmm. karma and afflictions, the reason why we suffer. Yeah. yeah, so that I'm talking in the technical uh, word of Buddhism, of renunciation in that sense. Yeah. And uh, that is self-compassion, wish to be free of suffering, but it's focused on me, oneself as opposed to focused on other, wish to be free of suffering, wish them to be free of suffering. So in that sense, you, you can't develop great compassion or, or body cheater or any of these things unless you've developed that renunciation. That's your launch pad from renunciation, great compassion, the great compassion that takes responsibility that I myself will I liberate them. Oh, excuse me, Siri. Mm -hmm. Siri's having a way in. <laughs> Someone gave me this watch and I don't know how to control it. Um, so, yeah, so launch pad. Mm. So renunciation to bodhicitta or great compassion takes responsibility from great compassion that takes responsibility to then bodhicitta. So if you don't have in a, in a, in a, like a ladders, you know, the, the rungs mm. on a ladder, you don't have these in those incremental ways, you mm. won't develop it. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that's no, so it's like logical subsequential steps. Yeah, right? that's yep. what I love about the Dharma. It's all there yep. like that. Yeah, but gotcha. as far as um, renouncing the beer, of course, as a nun, I would oh, yeah. say yes. <laughs> that's exactly what of I'm course. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pema. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Sometimes it's a good way to wake yourselves up by asking a question too. Otherwise, I'll just go on. I have one question. Is there a difference Aaron, between... I think you're speaking, are you? Oh, yes. I I'm sorry. I apologize. I forgot. 
I forgot to say that my name, Aaron. This is Aaron. I can't hear you, Aaron. Hmm. It's there. You go. I got a hmm. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. No problem. So, my question was, what is there? Is there a difference between the act of taking refuge, like in a traditional, like when we're just practicing like this, and the act of taking refuge and like a ceremony? Are they yeah. two different types of events? Yeah, like we'll we'll elaborate in maybe week five. If you can wait till then, I can elaborate more um, about the commitment of taking refuge and, and what that's involved and so forth. And we certainly who just like maybe you guys can indicate with a show of hands or a thumbs up or something, a reaction here. Who has actually taken refuge already? Can you do a, a reaction there? Oh, yeah. One. OK. And then we've got about one, two. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Victor. One, two, three. So most people have already. Brilliant. So that, that's a good starting point. But remember, it's evolving. Yeah. So it's deepening all the time. The more we understand, the more we can apply the meaning and so forth. So Aaron, the, as far as uh, elaborating, well, I'll talk more about it then. But what I'm trying to do, my uh, wish for you guys is to, over the next six weeks, develop that refuge even more incrementally. So that it's going to be totally different, that when you're retaking refuge or taking it newly, that it's going to be different to how you're taking it today. I'm not sure I addressed your question, though, so please kindly elaborate if I've misunderstood or not helped you. No, you did. Okay, brilliant. All righty, so let's, let's go on a little bit more then. Let's see of these computer skills. Okay, what are we doing? Oh, yeah, you can see that, right, Shanti Deva? Yeah, so I just put it this in because I, I just thought it was quite nice. So this is from Shanti Deva, Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Who can afford me good protection from this terror? With terrified, bulging eyes agape, I shall search the four directions for refuge. Then seeing no refuge in the four directions, I shall become enveloped in gloom. If there should be no refuge there at that time, what should I do? So most of the um, realms, you know, that we can be easily born into in our next life, you know, where are we going to find this protection? Right now we have it in this precious human rebirth. Are we utilizing it? Are we making the most of it? Because once we take that last breath and go back to the lower realms, our permanent residence, um, you know, we are going to be bulging eyes agape, terrified and bereft. And then also he said, therefore, from today onwards, I go for refuge to the victors, the protectors of migrating beings who strove for the purpose of protecting migrating beings and with great power eradicate all fear. Likewise, I perfectly go for refuge to the Dharma they have realized that clears away the fears of cyclic existence and also to the assembly of bodhisattvas. I just thought that was just so beautifully expressed in, in Shanti Devi's Bodhisattva's work of life and worth sharing. Okay, causal and resultant refuge. So when we take refuge, um, there's a cause and there's a result, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. So when we say, I take refuge until I'm enlightened, in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Supreme Assembly. So I take refuge. Okay, we're saying until I'm enlightened. So that's showing it's a Mahayana refuge, isn't it? It's not just until the end of this life, like a, like a Hinayana refuge would be, but this is until I'm enlightened. L leave the, the underlined bit out for now. I think I shaded it there. So just focus on I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. Just that bit right there. That there is referred to as the causal refuge. This is the cause, okay? And what we're talking about is Buddha Dharma Sangha that exists in others' continuum already. They've already realized this. The Buddhas realized true path, true cessations in their final, you know, capacity. Um, the, the, the Dharma refuge, true paths and true cessations, the Sangha, the Arya beings we're talking about there who have true paths and true cessations. And on that note, those Arya beings who possess true paths and true cessations, they can be lay people as well. Okay. 
So when we talk about Arya Sangha, we're talking about lay or ordained, as opposed to when we just talk about Sangha, then we're talking about the ordained community. But um, Arya Sangha is <clears throat> lay as well. So I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Supreme Assembly. So there's three main things there. You could even say four, right? You could say the causal refuge exists in others' continuum. They've already achieved it. And they are on whom we rely. So three. And you could even add in a fourth one there, cause. That's the cause of our taking refuge. But the, the thing is, when, we, when we're taking refuge until I'm enlightened, what we're also taking refuge in is our very potential to attain Buddha Dharma Sangha in our own continuum. The result. Okay. So this, this part that says, until I'm enlightened, that part is the resultant refuge. So when we do the refuge prayer, we're taking refuge in what's external to us, in others' continuum already accomplished, on whom we can rely the cause of our own generating true paths, true cessations in our own continuum, by which we then overcome our samsara. We become an Arya being. So I'm talking from the path of seeing onwards when you perceptually realize emptiness generate your first true path, okay? And then going on, you, that's the antidote to the afflictions and so forth, going on to actually abandon, so true cessations, right? True path, true cessations in our own continuum. And then ultimately when we become a Buddha, the final true cessation, Buddhahood, essence kaya, so that that's the, the two main elements there in that prayer, the causal and resultant refuge. And we rely on the causal refuge until we attain the resultant refuge. So from the Buddha who taught the Dharma and then the Sangha came along, the followers who actualized the Dharma in their continuum, these are our infallible guides. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so we're talking about an outer refuge, but we're also talking about an inner refuge. So we take outer refuge in the causal refuge, but ultimately it's this inner Buddha nature that's our refuge. It's a seed of enlightenment that exists within all sentient beings, anyone who's a mind possessor. And it's this Buddha nature, our own inner refuge, that it's going to transform into become the the buddha jewel so I'll, I'll leave that there for now then we've got the inner dharma okay so that's like our inner wisdom that can discern you know what to adopt and what to you know uh, abandon and reject and so forth what to overcome and it's that inner wisdom that's going to uh, potentially ripen in us being able to develop true past, true cessation, the Dharma jewel in our own continuum. And then this inner Sangha that we've got going on here, the potential so that we can give guidance and inspiration, you know, to others in the in the future. So outer refuge, independence on the outer refuge, uh, we, we can attain the, the inner refuge, the resultant refuge. So it's something, um, you know, something very worth remembering when we do this refuge prayer, because really it's talking about our Buddha nature and all of that sort of stuff as well, isn't it? The fact that we have, the, you know, this, our, the emptiness of our mind and the emptiness of the a Buddha's mind is the, the same, the lack of inherent existence. So it's got this same, you know, quality. And because our mind's because we are lacking inherent existence, because we are empty as a reason, right? Because we are empty, we can develop this potential to, to be developed, which is another part of our Buddha nature. We can develop our, um, you know, realize the four truths, realize the two truths, the four truths, the three jewels. We can develop the, the paths and grounds in our continuum because 
of emptiness, because things are lacking inherent existence, that means they do depend, they are related, interdependence, dependent arising. We can, by cultivating causes and conditions, we can attain the results we seek. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha in our own continuum, the resultant refuge. So does that make sense a little bit there with causal and, and resultant refuge? What else? I think I've got something else on that slide. Oh, yeah, that was just about the, it's still worth mentioning. The nature of our own mind is clear and knowing. So, the, you know, the nature of our mind on a, in a conventional way is clear and knowing. Ultimately, it lacks inherent existence. And therefore, because it is empty of inherent existence, uh, and, and because even from this conventional level, because the mind is clear and knowing, um, the, the stains have not, are not ingrained in, into the very nature of the mind. They can be removed. So, for instance, like, you know, the, on a clear blue sky, you know, clear um, blue sky day, you know, you don't see the clouds. They've, they've been removed. And even when you're in a plane and you're flying in, you're in low cloud cover and you fly above the clouds, you know, they haven't got in, into the very nature of the sky. They can be uh, removed by the wind of wisdom, for instance. They can be blown away by the wind of wisdom, so to speak. So the clouds are not ingrained in the sky. The stains are not ingrained in our mind. Um, the dirt is not in, you know, the sediment is not ingrained into the nature of the water. So various analogies we can use to try to bring that understanding, which means that the stains are adventitious. They arise dependently on causes and conditions, and therefore they can be overcome. So, um, you know, it's not at all times that we suffer. So suffering, uh, you know, when it's manifest suffering, for instance, we see its dependency on causes and conditions. But anyway, I'll talk about more of that when we go into the four truths another time. So, okay, I'm hoping that the causal and resultant refuge part is clear. Yeah? When you, when you do this refuge prayer, so Aaron, you were talking about this, when we do recite this prayer, these are the things that we want to bring to mind. So if at the very beginning when we took refuge, you had generated a sense of renunciation, fear of cyclic existence, compassion, great passion, may they be free of this, may they be free of cyclic existence. And then, you know, this utter reliance, this faith, this conviction that the three jewels can protect us. If you had those causes and you were developing, when you're saying the refuge prayer, you're, you're keeping in mind the meaning of how Independence on the causal Buddha Dharma Sangha jewel, I too can attain the resultant Buddha Dharma Sangha jewel in my own continuum. Then this would be one really good way of going for refuge. Does that make sense? How how it can evolve like that? Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. All right. So next, I was thinking about. Uh, covering oh yeah just to just to conclude on we're not really addressing bodhicitta but obviously it is a component of the the prayer so just here as far as the four lines go those next two lines relate to the bodhicitta so in this case by my merits of uh, listening to the dharma or by my merits of generosity and so forth um, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigrated beings and then you know when we get to that part we can actually be when we're reciting it there's so many things to be trying to think of and feel uh, we can even be thinking you know I dedicate all my past present future merits of not only myself but all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to attaining um, enlightenment to become a Buddha right to benefit sent sentient beings you know, so there's a lot to unpack. It's almost like in uh, reciting that prayer, it's almost like we need half an hour. Yeah, because quite often in class, we just go, and it's finished, isn't it? 
So, you know, we really need to be, become so familiar that we, we, we sort of just have it. And what I also, also do, I'm not sure if this is good practice or not, so you, you decide for yourself. But sometimes when I'm reciting the, the refuge prayer, I'm thinking as I've explained to you guys about the causal refuge and the resultant refuge, and I'm, I'm thinking like that. And then other times I'm just thinking as I'm reciting it, um, in front of me is, you know, Guru Shakyamuni Buddha. And I imagine beams of light like white purifying white nectar comes forth from the you know the um forehead of of guru shakamuni buddha and cleansing myself all my uh negativities of body and then i do speech and then i do mind so that can be another way of like going for refuge and we're purifying our negativities and then even on maybe, say, on the, the third repetition, if we've also got time as well, um, you know, bringing in like a, a golden nectar of light and these rays come forth and bring all the blessings, particularly the blessings of what we wish to actualize in that lesson. If it was a teaching on, you know, refuge, the four truths and so forth. Okay, so these are other techniques. Aaron, you've got a question. Hi. So one question, I am not sure if it's a question, but maybe a comment. Go I for it. do the Kishiti Garba practice from FPMT. Yep. And it also had a slightly different, like kind of like kind of a visualization with this, where it's when I take refuge, I'm supposed to imagine the two types of adventitious um, car, um, negative karma yeah. and imprints on my mind. And when it says until my enlightened, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, it says I forgot exactly what it asked you to represent, but it's slightly different. Is that okay to do as well? Yeah, totally. There's going to be variations amongst all things. And that's why I endeavor in this course to present to you at least probably three or four different ways of going for refuge and starting with a, like a different meditations at the beginning to generate those causes and so forth. And, uh, so there'll be some will be coming from like a tantric practice, like maybe the Kashiri Gaba one is maybe like a tantric practice. Some will, um, maybe also just like uh, you know the Shakyamuni Buddha one. Um, also in when we do Lama Chopa, I assume you guys have Guru Pudra, you know, at your center maybe fortnightly. What page? What is it? Eighty one, page eighty one, eighty two, into page eighty three. It goes through about establishing the merit field, oh, which I conveniently put in the background. I don't know if you can see it over here on my um, shoulder here, but, you know, like the, from the Lama Chirpa doing the, the refuge. So I'll show you all different ways to do it. I think, Aaron, if you're following a correct source, then there is no, there's no need for doubt. And that's the beauty of the FPMT is we, we, we can trust in our sources. We can trust in the, the recipe, the secret herbs and spices of the F, FPMT, you know. It's a, a flavor throughout all of our centers and um, wholeheartedly, we can trust in that. So, yeah, I feel confident for you if if, if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious because, like, I kind of was wondering, like, would we have to have, like, a certain, like, I know we're supposed to do, like, um, the seven limbs and such, so on, like, every practice, like, every main practice. And I was afraid, like, there ha this had to be kind of, like, the basic part. This had to be the basic part? Did you do not finish that yes. sentence? What? Oh no! I, I expected I some more words. But I, yeah, but I should clarify. I guess um, I was thinking it was like sort of like that's a necessary component of a basic practice, along with the other parts that we kind of have to have a complete practice. Yeah, yeah, totally. And like with the seven limbs, you know, the first one being prostration, right? So I mean, that even comes into doing, you know, the refuge prayer, mental, physical, verbal prostrations. So we, even within the refuge prayer, there's the, the the first limb of prostration, mentally, physically, and verbally. Do you see what I'm saying? So for a complete practice, definitely refuge, bodhicitta, the seven limbs, the four immeasurables. And we might even do something like that um, next, the beginning of next session as well, so that you can see um, an, an alternative to the Kishidi Gaba one that you're using. But yeah, we definitely want these essential elements. Yeah. Anyone else with a question while we're in non-screen sharing mode? Okay, I'll go on them.
Okay, so I wanted to to look at the ultimate and conventional three jewels. And so there's different levels. When we talk about the three jewels, you know, what are we talking about? Well, on an ultimate level, we're really talking about the Dharmakaya. So this is how we can say, you know, like our, our guru uh, is, you know, one with all Buddhas and all this sort of stuff. We're identifying with the Dharmakaya, the, the omniscient mind of all the Buddhas that pervades all, you know, knows all, knows all reality, knows all modes, knows all conventional truths, ultimate truths in each moment with one mind. Amazing. Amazing. So, you know, this is, yeah, this is something that we can, we can aim for. So this is our final destination, you know, Dharmakaya. Strap yourselves in. Let's go. So ultimate Buddha jewel. Um, now the Dharmakaya, when we talk about Dharmakaya, Rupakaya, I'm going to talk next week more about the, the Buddha jewel and I'll talk about briefly the Buddha bodies and everything there. But just know that the Dharmakaya has those two aspects. So we're talking about a wisdom truth body. So that's the one that's the, the Buddha's mind realizing the two truths in each moment of, of mind simultaneously. And then the other one is the nature truth body. And, and that I've actually alluded to already. That's like the, the, the supreme true cessation. You know, that's a, the Buddha's mind, that uh, the, the emptiness of a Buddha's mind, free from knowledge obscurations and naturally, of course, free from afflictive obscurations, which happened long ago. Um, so, yeah, the Dhammakaya is the ultimate Buddha jewel that we're seeking refuge in. And the conventional, this is how, you know, for us as assumably, for me personally, but for us assumably, we're non-Buddhas. So, you know, we can't realize and engage the Dhammakaya in that way. We need to be a, a Buddha to actually um have direct realization of of the buddha's holy mind but we can engage with the rupakaya and depending on the level like if we were arya bodhisattvas for instance we could engage the the sambhogakaya aspect of the buddha so um you know that's yeah i don't know how much detail to go into but um you know, the Sambhogakaya aspects, you, you see them with the marks and signs and uh, they're in Akanishta and they, they abide to the end of cyclic existence. Their retinue are Arya Bodhisattvas. They teach the Mahayana Dharma. Uh, they've got these five certainties or, or five qualities. Um, so, I, yeah, basically like that. And then the other type of Rupakaya is the emanation body or the, the namanakaya. And there's different types of namanakaya, but just briefly for now, I guess the, the main one we're talking about there is the supreme emanation body, Shakyamuni Buddha. So once again, you know, has the, the, the signs and marks and, you know, came to this world and just showed the aspect, um, you know, like the engaged in the 12 deeds and showed the aspect of, of um becoming like, you know, a bodhisattva and becoming a Buddha and, and so forth. Um, so we perhaps did not have that fortunate, pure karma to, to meet the, the Buddha in those days, 2,600 years ago and more, right? Um, certainly, as we purify our karma, we can get to the stage when we get to the Mahayana path of accumulation. It's got three stages within it, small, middling, and great. When we get to the great stage of the path of accumulation, things called continual stream of Dharma, we can actually receive teachings from statues. Like how amazing would that be? So this is something I dearly look forward to. You just You could just receive the direct teaching you know like Lama Sankapa used to receive teachings all the time from from Manjushri directly and from statues and Lama Ritisha at Bodhgaya you know the Tara statue yeah, like all these amazing things so when we take refuge in the the Buddha jewel we're talking about generally we're talking about this ultimate Buddha jewel of the Dharmakaya but certainly the conventional aspect and the symbolic aspect is a is kind of like um, the way I understand it, which may be wrong, of course. This way you've got to check up everything I say. Um, to me, the symbolic is kind of like stepping 
So and like it moves us in the direction of the more respect we we have to the symbolic triple gem, three jewels, the more it sort of you know purifies our mind and um, accumulates the merit to be able to see the conventional Buddha jewel, ultimate Buddha jewel. So that's the way I think of it. The more respect we can develop to the symbolic, the more it's going to lead us to directly experience the conventional and the ultimate. So then the Dharma jewel has these three levels. So when we talk about the Dharma jewel, basically what we're talking about is true paths and true cessations. Okay. They're minds, right? Well, a true past is a mind. A true cessation is an emptiness from the middle way consequence point of view, which is generally the only way I'll be presenting things. So this is in the continuum of an Arya being, which is in the continuum of a Sangha jewel. We're talking about true past, true cessations. And from a Mahayana point of view, true past, true cessations in the continuum of a Mahayana Arya. So having this realization, perceptual realization of emptiness and so forth from the path of seeing onwards. And what else do I think I might want to say about that? Mm, it's probably enough. And then the conventional. So the conventional Dharma jewel, we're talking about the scriptures there. So this is not actually a, a Dharma jewel in itself because it's not true past and true cessations, but it's the texts and so forth that teach how to accomplish the true paths and true cessations. And then, um, you know, as we develop our refuge, we come to value even a single syllable of the teachings. So if you're walking along and you see prayer flags on the ground and you've got the syllables touching the ground, not so good, huh? So wherever you are, if you see, you know, Dharma on the ground, oh, I get so horrified when I go to a particular uh, retreat of a particular teacher and uh, I see students with their texts on the ground. Just horrifies me. I got a really strong reaction to it because it's kind of, for me, it's not, it's not valuing the, the most precious thing we have in this world, apart from our gurus, of course, which is the Dharma. You know, the Dharma, which is going to lead us to this ultimate Dharma jewel, our true protection, liberated from samsara. I mean, it's it's utterly sublime. It blows our minds. So even having respect for the symbolic, it can um, help us in this journey to accumulate merit, purify negativities, and obviously, you know, generate uh, respect and uh, lead us to our, our journey, our, our destination, paths and grounds and, and final result. All right. And then uh, finally, the Sangha jewel. So it's once again got these three levels. Now, the ultimate here is also true past and true cessations. And that's a bit confusing because, um, we, you know, we're talking about the mind and the emptiness of their mind that's abandoned all obscurations here in the case of a, a Buddha or in the case of an Arhat abandoned the afflictive obscuration. So true past, true cessations in the continuum of, this is from the Mahayana refuge point of view, remember, Mahayana Aryas, and that Mahayana Aryas includes Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So a, a, a Buddha is a, a Buddha jewel and also a Sangha jewel. Okay. So the ultimate Sangha jewel is once again the same as what we have with the Dharma jewel, this true past, true cessations. But where it's different is on a conventional level is we're talking about the person. So we're talking about a being. We're no longer talking about a mind, a true path, or an emptiness of a mind, a true cessation. We're talking about the actual person, the Arya being. So that's the Sangha jewel at a conventional level. And then the symbolic is talking about the Sangha. And so this is not the, the lay in the ordained community, as we saw with Arya beings. You know, um, I mentioned before the, the Sangha jewel, that is the conventional Sangha jewel, the Arya beings that can be in the continuum of a lay or ordained. But now when we talk about the symbolic, we're talking about ordinary Sangha members. So ordinary in the sense that they're not Aryas. They haven't perceptually realized emptiness. Okay. 
but they hold the the vow um the pradamoksha you know gets all vow or you know uh, fully ordained and so forth and they're living their life in accord with the buddha's teachings the teacher of refuge to be able to cultivate to become the the assisters you know the the, the sangha jewel but they can't become the sangha jewel unless they attain the dharma jewel true past true cessations and then they will go on to attain the buddha jewel so at a symbolic level, these are things we can access immediately in our very environment. And yet, I think sometimes we become quite complacent and we have all these images and texts around us and and um, and sometimes, you know, even Sangha, and, and we, we, we take them for granted. So I think this is where we perhaps can strengthen our training as lay, but also as Sangha myself, right? So strengthen our training in these symbolic objects of refuge so that we can deepen and, and develop our respect, evolve our refuge and uh, taking refuge in the, the external, the outer Buddha Dharma Sangha jewel. Why? So that we too can attain Buddha Dharma Sangha jewel in our own continuum, the resultant refuge. Why? So that we can benefit others, right? Help them effortlessly spontaneously in each moment knowing exactly what is in accord with the disposition of a very sentient being in front of us and um, the more we reflect on refuge I find the more we're in tune to actually receiving the help and I know just with preparing this course it was so weird uh, because you know I would think, oh, I'll just have a look at this book. And it's a book I hadn't picked up for maybe, I don't know, eight, nine years or something. And just the synchronicity of things, right? You could call it synchronicity or you could call it um, blessings of the guru. But there was just this inspiration, this blessing, this inspiration to pick something up that I hadn't considered or to, if I had a question or a doubt in mind, then, you know, something would, would reveal itself. So it was pretty kind of awesome and weird and wonderful. And I think it's just because I tried to embrace um, the this module and and through embracing it, be open to developing a basis of refuge. So I really encourage you guys over the, the duration of this course, certainly over the next week, to really pay attention. So not only... I didn't mean to in class, but I mean that as well. But I mean, pay attention to your environment. So pay attention to the the symbolic three jewels in your own home. Pay attention to the valuable venerable sangha at your dharma center, like venerable Dundrup, you know, and whoever else is there. I don't know the sangha community. I guess um, you know, Geshul is probably oh, he's probably in India, is he at the moment? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, uh, when Geshe Sherub's back and so forth, you know, like, but even when they're not there, you know, these, these are, because we're talking about the Buddha jewel, the Dharmakaya, you know, the true past, true cessations in the continuum of Arya beings and being that the, the Buddha jewel as well, we can connect without being physically even close to these uh, objects of refuge, because we're talking about um, like, for instance, Buddha's mind pervading all, you know. So this is also something um, that I have, uh, you know, had a taste of, a, a, you know, a small experience in is connecting with the, the guru, the seeing the guru is inseparable from the Buddha. And because of the guru's holy qualities, and being one with the Buddha and that pervasiveness of body, speech, and mind of a Buddha, um, being able to connect. So even on a daily basis, you know, when we're seeking te temporary refuges, well, we can upsize that and actually go to the real hardcore thing of actual Buddha Dharma Sangha Jewel. And we can connect even when we're not physically, we can be mentally, spiritually connected. And this is a far uh, more sustainable and more pure form of refuge than, uh, you know, 
the attachment and grasping and so forth that can come up when we are in close proximity. So any one of these jewels, Buddha jewel, Dharma jewel, or Sangha jewel can, can protect. And I believe, I know I read somewhere differently, um, but I believe Lama Zerpa Rinpoche has mentioned even just one of these can protect us from the lower realms. So, you know, if, we, if it's the time of death, to bring one to mind, maybe a Sangha jewel to mind or the Dharma jewel or just the Buddha jewel, you know, just one of these, then it, it's enough to protect us from the lower realms. Um, perhaps we all, no, not perhaps, I think we definitely need all three to protect us from samsara. But from the lower realms, even just one. Okay. All right, so final objects of refuge. I think I can stop sharing. Uh, do I want to go into that? Yeah, okay, well, well, we've got a little bit of time. So the Dharma jewel is an actual Buddha jewel, okay? It's the final destination that we wish to attain. The, the, the Buddha uh, has abandoned all that is to be abandoned, has no mistaken appearances, and in that sense is a final a final result, a final refuge of what we're aiming for, okay? So the Rupakaya, also being Buddha, is an actual or, or also a final Buddha jewel. And um, I, I want to ask you, though, true, I want you guys to do the work. <laughs> I know it's getting late. You've worked all day. But you guys do the work. Dharma jewel, true paths, true cessations in the continuum of Mahayana Aryas. Is it an actual Dharma jewel? Yes or no and why? Is the Dharma jewel true paths and true cessations? Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. What about the collection of scriptures? You know, the Tengyur and the, the, the Kengyur and the Tengyur and all of this sort of stuff. Are these actual Dharma jewels? Are they actual true paths and true cessations? Yes or no? Who's going to be brave? Are they minds? For instance, true paths? Is it the emptiness of a mind, true cessation? They're not, are they? So that's a that's a uh, that's a terminal uh, bugger. Oops, that's what Australians say. That's a terminological division there. So it's not an actual. Um, the Mahayana Arya beings, they are actual because they're, they're persons, they're beings, they're beings who have perceptually realized emptiness. So therefore they have at least that true path of perceptually realizing emptiness. They may not have a true cessation, okay? That's not until the, they, uh, their true path is abandoning obscurations and it's not until they have abandoned obscurations a portion of even that they attain the true cessation so they might just have one a true path and that's a, a, if you have a true path you are an aria being you are an actual sangha jewel okay all right so I'll stop sharing so anything like the the scriptures you know like the scriptures of the the the, the texts and stuff they're not final refuges because we're going to leave them when we cross to the other shore. It's like, you know, you, we use them in our, our boat and we paddle across the, the seas of samsara. But when we get to the other shore of nirvana, liberation, enlightenment, then we abandon the boat. We don't just pick it up and then carry it with us. So the, the scriptural dharmas are not a final refuge. We don't take them with us. And um, the Arya's true paths, Okay, we generally say that that's not a final refuge. Okay, um, the, the, the nirvana, um, the nirvana without remainder, say, 
uh, Hiniana's true cessation, not a final refuge, because there's still deceptive appearances that things still appear to inherently exist for that person when they're not in meditative equipoise. They haven't abandoned knowledge obscurations, okay, the imprints of the afflictions which throw up the appearances of true existence, for instance. And if you were a body suffering on the pure grounds, we've abandoned afflictive obscurations, but we haven't abandoned the knowledge obscurations. So similarly, this too is uh, still with, you know, things to abandon. So not a final object of refuge. So really the only final object of refuge is what exists in the continuum of a Buddha. So is a Buddha or the true past, true cessations in the continuum of a Buddha. Everything else is not final, but it's a, a way of traversing, but it's not the final destination. We still have more grounds and paths to, to go. All right. So I think... I might have said enough. There was one other thing I was going to go into, but it's more like a visualization. And I don't know if I want to rush it in. I could do it in the 10 minutes with you, or if we go a little bit over or something, but maybe you've got some questions. You talk, I'll drink. Are you always this shy? I reckon by the time six weeks comes along, I won't get a word in. All right. Hand raised. Aaron, yes, my friend. Would other lineages um think of the resultant and causal vehicle the same i'm gonna to have to guess because i don't know other lineages i mean i can't see why not perhaps you've got more knowledge than me that you can share on this because we're really talking cause and effect a cause and a result and mm -hmm. The only way we can attain the result is by obviously following the cause, which is, you know, devoting and wholeheartedly taking refuge in the, the Buddha and the, the, the teachings of the Buddha and the followers that, like the nurses, assist us and help us to accomplish the refuge. So I can't see it being uh, contradicted by other traditions or whether they elaborated in the same way. Um, but I don't think they would say it's contradictory. Do you have some ideas, Aaron? I don't think they would think it's contradictory, but I was thinking like some traditions that kind of hold that we're already enlightened. Oh, I see where you're coming from. Yes. Like, because they would say like, well, you're not causing anything per se. Hmm. I don't know how they would... Um respond in that way you're from what you're saying they're saying that we're already enlightened and so there is no um we are already the resultant refuge and, but they still rely on buddha dharma sangha and they still take refuge so i'm i'm really unqualified to answer from another tradition because i've only tried you know to really take embrace this tradition and I and for me that was where my capabilities were, um, because I didn't want to disperse too widely and end up with a soup of dharma. So I've tried to just wholeheartedly embrace one tradition, and then as my confidence grows and my understanding grows, then I can go out to pursue other traditions and see how it fits for me. But for me to subscribe. Uh, to the teachings that we are already a Buddha did not make sense to my disposition. And so, um, you know, that just doesn't fit with my mind at all. Otherwise, why would we have suffering? Why would we have anger? Why would we not re know every phenomenon that exists? You know, I can I actually 
yeah, I do remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can barely remember what I had for breakfast this morning, right? So, you know, to, to know what I had for breakfast at exactly 15 years ago, nine months and two days, a Buddha would know that. So it just doesn't make sense to me to think that we're already Buddha. And I wonder if it gets to the same type of thing where, you know, they, they, have, they still have to have this uncovering, don't they? They're already Buddha, but they have to have this uncovering still. And, you know, we're talking about an uncovering, um, but we're talking about it from the stages of the path where we're not Buddha. And although we had this Buddha nature, this pristine, um, you know, body of a Buddha, let's say, uh, this, you know, like gold, you know, nugget of a Buddha, um, right now it's still in the filth, you know. And it's true that this once we, you know, clean the filth off, the, the gold hasn't been penetrated, has it? It's still pure in its nature. It's unchanging in that sense. So, you know, we talk about it from a Buddha nature point of view, and I'm more comfortable um, talking from what I know than I, I'm very, uh, I was going to say scared, but I'm not scared. I'm very cautious because of my love for the Dhamma. I'm very cautious of saying things that I don't feel are correct or if I'm unqualified to, to comment on, I can only comment from my own um, tradition and understanding. And yeah, certainly that pristine Buddha nature, that, that emptiness of the mind or um, is unchanging. Uh, also the clear and knowing nature is unchanging. You know, it's it's always clear and unknowing, uh, clear, and, clear and knowing, Freudian slip. Um, so from that sense, it's this pristine, unchanging, but as far as, you know, Buddha nature, there's two types, right? So there's this unchanging part, but there is the changing bit, which is the potential to develop where we go on to develop these qualities that we don't yet possess for the welfare of all sentient beings. So, yeah, sorry, Aaron, a lot of blah, 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 and probably not really helping. <laughs> no, thank you. It's really useful because, I mean, it's a really deep subject, you know, like I think you it's, it would take a lot of training. I was I. I'm like it's such an it's both academic but also practical too like you brought up I think it's um also one thing to be very uh very vigilant with is to not uh diminish or rubbish or you know disregard other traditions because they too are the teachings of the Buddha right and we don't want to be abandoning the Dharma so just because it's not my disposition doesn't mean it's not a very valid path for, for others. And, um, and yeah, I just don't understand it. But I, I don't imagine it's, you know, with contradiction, I imagine it's just a different presentation of, of generally saying the same type of thing, I imagine, but more catered and suited to the dispositions of, of those who are the practitioners. Okay, more from you guys. I heard Americans talk a lot. What's going on? You're you're refuting that that uh, that judgment that people have. Outgoing, friendly. <laughs> Come on, you. You've been um, consistent. Like Pema, Hi, Dan. Dan. Dan here. I've got a question. Um. Um. You may recall the teachings that you gave some time ago at Shenrezig were on the 12 links. And yep. um, I get a bit confused sometimes between the difference between liberation and enlightenment. Good, um, good question. So I think I, I asked the question back at those teachings about what is the difference. And from memory, you talked about the motivation of the individual. Um, but I think you also talked that um, someone who has attained liberation has abandoned afflictive emotions, but to um, achieve enlightenment, you need to remove the knowledge obscurations. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct, Dan. So I suppose um, in one of the first slides you put up was the quote from Chandra Kirti. Um, yeah, amazing. And I, I wrote it down somewhere. Um, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha are the refuge for those desirous of liberation. Yes. So because I have problems separating liberation from enlightenment, are we saying that Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and the refuge for those 
um, are not desirous for someone who has obtained liberation, but yet to obtain enlightenment? Um, or am I just, am I just splitting hairs a little bit too much there? I don't mind splitting hairs because that's I love learning. And, you know, to me, that's the precious of the teachings. I much rather go into depth and detail than skim the surface and not really cover much. So I'm fine with splitting hairs. Um, just for the benefit of the group, I'll just go back and backtrack a little bit, if that's mm. okay, Dan. Of course. Okay. So when we talk about liberation and enlightenment, generally they're different. You can talk about liberation and you can mean enlightenment by thinking great liberation. But generally we talk about liberation and enlightenment as if two different things. So if one's aiming for liberation, they're aiming to abandon the afflictive obscurations, all of you know that the, the self-grasping ignorance and from which self-grasping ignorance, you know, everything branches out. So all the improper, you know, conceptualizations about things and it brings about the afflictions and, you know, the anger and avert, anger and jealousy and pride and, you know, all these, you know, afflictions by which we create actions and then we, you know, perpetuate our suff suffering and cycle existence. Uncontrolled birth, sickness, aging, death, not getting what we want, getting what we don't want, you know, yada, yada, yada. So if you're looking at attaining liberation, you're looking at abandoning that afflictive obscurations and th that includes not only the afflictions, but the seeds, the seeds of afflictions, which give rise to a latter moment of anger and jealousy and pride and so forth. That's liberation, nirvana, freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from afflictive obscurations. Freedom from fear. You know, one of the causes of refuge, right? Fear, useful fear. Fear of samsara, free of samsara. So this is usually the goal of a middling scope practitioner who seeks liberation for oneself alone. Okay. So that's different to, and it's in the continuum of an aria, and it's in the continuum more so of an ahat, someone who's a foe destroyed, destroyed the foe, destroyed the enemy. What is the enemy? The afflictions. Okay. Yeah. So then, so that's liberation. So then we can talk about great liberation, but we usually just term it enlightenment. And it's even more than that. So now we're talking about abandoning the two obscurations, afflictive obscurations and knowledge obscurations. So not only the afflictions and the seeds of afflictions, but even the imprints of the afflictions. So which throw up, you know, tendencies, but the, the main chief, uh, Knowledge obscuration is that it throws up these appearances, these imprints of things, imprints from the ignorance, imprints being that the, it presents to us appearances of inherent existence. Even if we've realized emptiness perceptually and we know things don't exist inherently, still due to knowledge obscurations, things will appear inherently existent, but we will know that it's, you know, not existing in the way it appears. So we won't be seduced and, um, you know, like ensnared in all of this, these appearances and so forth. So knowledge obscurations by definition is that which mainly hinders omniscience. So to become a Buddha, to become enlightened, we need to abandon knowledge obscurations. And that's the goal of the Mahayanist no longer settling for liberation where we still cannot fulfill our own purpose entirely. We still have mistaken appearances. We certainly can't fulfill the, the welfare of all others most extensively. And so rather than settling for a partial abandonment and partial realizations, the Mahayana sets their goal for, liber uh, for enlightenment, great liberation, but enlightenment, let's just call it. And so that goal is to, to, fully be able to enact the welfare of all sentient beings by fully abandoning all that is to be abandoned and fully developing all realizations. Okay? Venerable, Venerable I'm, I, I think we made a mistake um, with the, the class that comes, that starts now with the link. Okay, no problem. So I think we, have, we have to kind of leave so that that can happen because there was a mistake. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it fixed so that we can go later uh, next yeah, week. Yeah, 
That's okay. But we covered basically the essence. I think Dan would be happy. He's got what he needs as well. And perhaps it was helpful to others. So it, because we're in a hurry, right? So you've got another class starting. They need the link. So please kindly do the yeah. dedications yourself. Let's all get out of here to give them what they need and dedicate. And thank you for your participation. And see you again next week. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Paola. Thank you,